Okay, I started recording, and so let me introduce you. This is uh, Lucana D'Souza, uh, who's an urban wildlife specialist with the Arizona uh, Game and Fish Department, who's going to be speaking with us today uh, about uh, the wildlife uh, around our community. Good afternoon. Thanks for tuning in. Um, Thank you for the introduction. Um, so I was contacted by one of your community members. Um, I you know, understand maybe there've been lots of wildlife sightings that people um, maybe have some questions about, um, are interested in learning more about, maybe have some concerns about. Um, so we will, uh, we will talk about um, wildlife and um, why they live among us and um, hopefully we will be able to, if anybody has questions, um, get you guys to get some answers for you. Um, so thank you for the introduction. My name is Lokana. Um, as Don said, I work for the Arizona Game and Fish Department. Uh, so our agency is responsible for managing wildlife in the state of Arizona. Uh, we manage more than 800 species of wildlife. So there's a lot going on. Um, and when I say manage, um, it really is from a population perspective. And so we're talking about having wildlife uh, be persistent on the landscape, you know, in perpetuity. And so we're looking at conservation of species. And so sometimes that means we, you know, have to um, invest in habitat for these animals. Sometimes we may be doing translocations or reintroductions. Um, it doesn't mean that we focus on individual animals, which is usually what the average homeowner is concerned with is, you know, whatever critter is in their backyard in the moment. Um, so uh, when we manage wildlife, we're, we're looking at species um, and populations of species. Um, so Game and Fish does a lot of different things. A lot of people think of us in terms of um, we're the folks that manage hunting. Um, that is a big part of what we do. That's, you know, largely our income is from those consumptive users. Um, however, we do a wide variety of things, um, shooting sports and there's, you know, non-game animals. Um, and so, you know, when you think about things like California condors or black-footed ferrets or Mexican gray wolves. Um, those are some examples of species that we've done a lot of active management to bring those animals back to Arizona. Um, but yeah, off-highway vehicles and shooting sports and, um, you know, lots, lots of different angles and uh, uh, perspectives go into um, our jobs here. So, um, Today we're gonna to focus on living with urban wildlife. And so sometimes it is a surprise to people that we have a lot of wildlife that not only occupy you know, natural habitat throughout the state, but they also occupy urban areas and so altered um, landscapes. So there may not be very much natural habitat at all. Maybe there's pockets. Um, but these animals have grown accustomed to living among people. And in many cases, um, you know, these animals do quite well living among us because of what we humans provide on the landscape. And so we're gonna talk more about that. Um, so in general, wildlife need the same things that we need. So they need food, water, and shelter. And if they can find all of these resources in our communities, then they are gonna set up shop. They're gonna become residents just like we are. And so that's what you find in some of our, our three most common species that, um, that we get calls about in Tucson, well, really statewide, are coyotes, javelina, and bobcats. And these are, these are animals that, um, are just, they're, they're common and they, they live right alongside us. Um, in most cases, we get by just fine and sometimes there are conflicts 
Um, and so we want to we want to try to minimize those conflicts. Um, so we kind of have to do our part and not expect that wildlife are going to know what uh, our human boundaries are. Um, they don't distinguish between wild prey and domestic animals. And so it's kind of up to us to to uh, make sure that we uh, we keep our pets safe and um, our plantings and landscaping safe and so on um, if we don't want wildlife to partake. Um, so food, water, and shelter. Um, obviously these are, these are provided in a natural situation um, where you have uh, you know, vegetation communities. Um, sometimes some communities leave areas of open space within that's part of um, you know, their development. Uh, they've had to set aside open space. Um, and, you know, I, I think it's important to remember um, when framing some of this stuff that there are, uh, we all sort of fall along a spectrum in terms of our appreciation and really our tolerance for wildlife. And so while some people may feel really alarmed and concerned that there's a, bad, a bobcat you know, mother raising her kittens in their yard. The people next door love it. They really enjoy it. Um, you know, they they are looking to have those kinds of opportunities. And so, um, you know, we have to we have to kind of understand that uh, that although we may feel a certain way and we maybe we feel strongly about it, our neighbors may feel differently. Um, but regardless, there are always ways that we can address concerns if we have any. Um, so, you know, as I mentioned, if there's natural open space um, or people have native plantings in their yards and so on, you know, those are just natural resources, um, natural food sources for our wildlife and that's great. Um, you know, it's always a good idea to, uh, to plant native plants on, pro on our properties um, because you are providing our local wildlife with the uh, resources that um, that uh, that are you know they can find elsewhere. Um, if we start to move towards more um, ornamental type plants, um, then we have you know we may create a situation where we've got something that's like you know, an ice cream parlor. All of a sudden, um, there are yummy yummy uh, flowers and succulents and things like that to eat as opposed to uh, you know, a native palate. So um, it's important to understand that. Um, but that the reality is that once we start sort of creating our own, um, our own landscapes for aesthetics and so on in our yards, sometimes we, uh, we plant with things that are, that are going to attract wildlife, which is great. You know, most people appreciate hummingbirds, um, but you know, pretty much, everything else. I don't think I've ever gotten any calls um, of people who uh, who are upset about hummingbirds. So <laughs> it's one of those species that uh, that I think across the board people appreciate, but just pr pretty much everything else, um, you know, you have some people that, that love them and some people hate them and most people fall somewhere in between on the spectrum. Um, so yeah, when we when we create habitat for, for critters, um, we're not always going to only attract that species, that type of wildlife. And so that's important to understand. Um, you know, if you start if you start altering the landscape and um, you know, maybe you really love quail and you love seeing all those little fuzzy babies and you know, little fluff balls running around. Um, and so you're like, well, let's put some seed out so we can really, you know, enjoy these more and see more families. And, you know, maybe let's invest in a quail block. Um, just understand that uh, those quail blocks, of course, are enjoyed by many different types of wildlife. So not only birds, but um, in the twilight hours, you're going to have rodents that partake in that uh, in that food source. And then of course, you're gonna attract day and night predators of the birds 
and the rodents um, that, and so, you know, understand that again, that's not, uh, that's not your target species perhaps, um, but still you have made a mo modification to the landscape. And so you are providing resources, uh, really, uh, you're attracting the food for the predators as well. So just kind of looking at the ripple effects and, um, and how your actions um, may have unintended consequences. Um, so really of, of those resources that I talked about, food, water, and shelter, food is, is the biggest motivator um, and probably the biggest kind of predictor of, of wildlife behavior. Um, and so you really want to key in on if you're seeing certain critters around a lot, and I'm not talking about something crossing through, passing through, um, and sometimes wildlife have trails through people's property. Um, you know, you may have javelina that they come through um, every evening on their way, uh, you know, to, to, to make their rounds and, and go forage at night. And, and that's kind of just one of those things. Um, you happen to be in that path. But if you're, but if you're having wildlife remain in your yard a lot, um, probably the first thing to look at is, is what are they doing there? What are these animals doing while they're in my yard? And, um, you know, feeding is, is a very common um, reason why they're there. It's the most common, but yes, to, you know, things like any kind of water, um, of course, free water in the desert is uh, hard to come by. So anything like a bird bath or a fountain or a swimming pool or a pond or even irrigation um, is going to attract wildlife because that's, a, that's not a common resource that they have access to. So some of those things um, you can address if, if that's what's drawing wildlife in. Um, and sometimes it is a case of uh, you just have a nice yard um, or maybe there's a space behind a shed or inside or under your home um, or under a porch where it's providing um, a shelter site for some types of wildlife. And it could be anything from, you know, skunks or snakes or javelina, uh, bobcats, what have you. And so there's ways to address that as well. Um, what you, you know, again, what you wanna key in on is what, what is the wildlife doing um, on my property? And you observe that and then you kind of, that gives you a clue of what you need to address if the presence of these animals is concerning to you. Um, now, quite often, when people are experiencing conflict or perceived conflict with wildlife, they jump to a conclusion, well, I know how to resolve this. All I need to do is, you know, trap or hire a company to come and trap that critter or that group of animals, and all my problems are going to go away. Um, so uh, there may be some of you who have, have thought that way. It really is a pretty common perspective is, you know, this is what's causing concern to me right now. I want this animal gone. I want this animal to be, you know, out of here, disappear off the landscape. Um, I don't know how many of you have ever tried to trap uh, a common animal um, and found success with that, but I will tell you, that if everything else remains the same and all you do um, is trap that animal and remove that animal and uh, nothing else changes, you're very likely to have that species return. And it doesn't mean that that animal, depending on what they are, they are gonna wanna return to their home range. Um, but you're most likely uh, just going to get different, different individuals of that same species because that food and or the water and or the shelter that these animals were partaking in before were, still remains there. It's, it, nothing has changed on your property. Um, so the best way to resolve any kind of conflict 
is to look at those attractants and remove those attractants. Um, sometimes you can exclude wildlife. Um, and in the case of javelina, that's um, a more easy thing to do just because they can't come up and over a wall um, like bobcats and coyotes and raptors and so on. Um, you, you can physically exclude them. And so if you wanna keep a yard that's full of, you know, rose bushes or, um, or something like that, uh, you know, lots and lots of uh, petunias and uh, various ornamental flowers, then you probably wanna look at um, a physical exclusion. Now that doesn't have to always mean that you have to, you know, wall off your whole yard um, for, you know, for things like, uh, plants, you can you can put things in a backyard that's already walled. Um, you can have high planters that are out of reach. Um, you can do hanging pots. Uh, so basically, you're you're removing you're essentially removing the attractant from the critter that is um, you know causing property damage because you're putting it out of reach. So you're putting pots potted plants up on a wall or on a baker's rack or up on a table. Um, that's out of reach now. Javelina will stand on their hind legs to, to get these kinds of things, but you get the idea um, that exclusions can work as well. And there are, there are some, you know, exclusions that you can do for coyotes as well, but coyotes, um, you know, they come over a, a six foot fence with ease. And uh, most developments, that's about as high as you can go. Uh, bobcats can get over a much higher barrier. So you're probably not gonna keep those out. So really when it comes down to, um, you know, to exclusions, you have to, um, you have to understand wildlife and what they're capable of doing. Um, now wildlife are opportunistic. And so if you have domestic animals on the landscape, um, it is a reasonable assumption that you're going to attract predatory wildlife. And, you know, I don't know how many people in the community have chickens. They have become increasingly popular. Um, everybody wants to have their own fresh eggs and, uh, and whatnot. Um, We're not which, permitted to uh, have okay. uh, farm animals here in Oro Valley. Okay, so that, that helps a bit, but you know, those, the, that, kind of thing attracts just about everything you can think of from Gila monsters that eat eggs to, you know, snakes and that eat chicks and, you know, skunks and foxes and coyotes and bobcats and raptors and, and just about, um, just about anything you can think of. Um, so uh, just something to understand that, um, you know, if we have domestic animals like cats or small dogs, um, and you think, well, I have a physical barrier in my yard and around my yard. And so, you know, I'm going to leave my animals out there because, you know, they'll be safe because of that barrier. Well, um, it's, uh, it's, it's not the exclusion that you, that you think it is, um, you know, based on what we've talked about. Uh, you've got wildlife that can certainly get over. If it's not jumping over, um, it's, you know, it's flying right into your yard. Um, and so we do have some raptors that can take small animals, um, you know, again, really small dogs and, and small cats and, and rabbits and, and so on. And so um, just something to think about is you don't want to leave domestic animals out um, unattended in a yard. Uh, because they really, uh, they really are not going to be safe from any any kind of predatory wildlife that may be in the area, and and it really is impossible to predict what may come through or how many come through or uh, when they're going to come through. Uh, you can't really anticipate that. Uh, what we recommend is for domestic animals that they be in a completely enclosed pet run. So something essentially that's like a cube. It's got all of its walls. Um, you know, you may have a combination, some, some uh, solid sided, um, it, uh, you know, to provide some shade, but it has to have a roof. Preferably it has a floor as well that you can bury down into the earth. Um, a lot of people connect their pet run right up to a doggy door. And so their small animals can come and go as they please, but they're safe. 
They're protected from anything that might come into the yard. Um, you know, again, wildlife are going to be opportunistic. So when they see um, opportunities, they're going to grab those opportunities. Um, and it doesn't take long to jump in and, and get a small pet from a yard and jump right back out. So that is just, those, those are some common conflicts that people have um, with, with wildlife, basically had the javelina eating landscaping and predatory wildlife eating domestic animals. And so just going back and making sure that we are doing our best, we have good animal husbandry practices and we're doing our best not to attract the attention um, and invite wildlife into our yards. Um, you know, so it's, it's the food, it's the water. Like I said, sometimes you have um, maybe dense vegetation in your yard and wildlife are just using that to, uh, you know, take a nap in the shade um, and, uh, you know, get out of sight of, of other critters. Uh, bobcats are a real common one that uh, females like to raise their young in people's backyards um, just because it, it's, got that extra layer of protection where it's got a, you know, a perimeter wall. Um, and so, you know, some people really enjoy that. Some, but some people not so much, but if you, you know, if you don't want them hanging out, um, you probably ought to make some modifications um, looking at, uh, you know, what are they using there? Is it because the vegetation is so thick? You can look at doing some pruning, um, trimming things up from the ground so it doesn't provide as good of cover for these animals. Um, and also so you can see what's in your yard before you, you know, let your, let your dog out. Um, so There's pretty a much question from uh, one of the attendees, if, if I might uh, allow them to Ask sure. questions. Yeah. Uh, you wanted it to be fairly informal. Uh, one of the questions was, is there a size or weight of a dog that is safe to allow outside by itself? You know, with wildlife, there are no guarantees. So I wouldn't really give you like a pound cutoff because as soon as I do that, something's going to fall outside of that. Um, you know, if you, if you think about, you know, how big wildlife is and kind of what they typically eat, especially in a natural situation. Um, so like bobcats, for instance, um, you know, they're mostly eating rodents and rabbits, you know, lizards, birds, that type of thing. So, you know, you've got most of their prey are on the smaller side. Um, however, they are capable of killing something that's much larger than they are. And so um, there is no hard and set rule that I can say, yes, under this, you know, this many pounds, you definitely want to have a pet run. And if you're above this many pounds, um, you're safe because sometimes you could have multiple animals enter your yard at once. Um, you know, you could have three coyotes come in and, and suddenly your 30 pound dog, you know, is, outnumbered. Um, so there isn't, um, there's no hard and fast rule for that. So, um, so generally, uh, I'll, you know, I'll interject if my next door neighbor has a, uh, a Bouvier, uh, and they get up to 110 pounds. She was out walking the Bouvier and, uh, the Javelinas, I, I think, uh, uh, attack the dog uh, while she was walking it on the street, uh, even though she was right there with the dog on the leash, uh, even though it was a very large dog, uh, presumably because either they confused it with a, with a coyote with, uh, and thought it was a threat to their babies, the javelina babies, or just in general, they, they go after uh, uh, dogs and canines, uh, canids uh, that... Uh, that look like they might be a threat to their pack. Yeah, so with javelina, and that really is the other the other um, conflict that people have with javelina is um, walking dogs. And so javelina um, rely more heavily on their sense of smell than they do sight. So they're not really keying in on, that's a chihuahua or that's a Great Dane. Basically they're saying, I smell a canine 
And I know that canines are a danger. Um, javelina are prey animals. And canids, our natural canids, like coyotes and wolves, um, are predators. And so when they smell canines, which of course all of our domestic dogs are, um, they fall in that same family, the javelina are perceiving a threat. And so they are going to react to that threat in, in a number of different ways. And sometimes they're going to leave the area. Um, they're gonna get away from that threat. And sort of the opposite extreme is they are going to try to get that threat to leave. And so that may involve something um, that could end up in an actual physical altercation like what you described or um, more often they're, you know, they, you see them bristle up. They're trying, they're prey animals. They're trying to make themselves look bigger. Like, hey, don't mess with me. Um, they make this popping sound with their teeth. Um, and uh, and it's, it's kind of alarming when you hear it. So it works. That is an effective strategy of like, hey, don't mess with me. Uh, sometimes they'll actually bluff charge. And so they'll come running at the dog, um, what they consider to be the threat, trying to get the animal to leave the area. And so there are some, um, you know, basic, pretty common sense um, things that, that, you know, uh, we can do as dog owners and dog walkers that can, you know, minimize, um, you know, the chance of any kind of direct contact between dogs and javelina, because we definitely want to avoid that. Um, obviously, if that's allowed to happen, it can um, cause uh, harm to, to, you know, both parties involved. Um, and, you know, potentially people too, if you reach in there um, and try to try to save your dog because your dog is surrounded by all these javelina, um, then you could get accidentally bitten in the process. So, um, you know, when you're walking a dog, you always, always want to have your dog on leash um, from the moment you step out the door. Um, you know, there could be javelina right in your yard. So you don't want to wait till, you know, to put your dog on leash until you're, you know, leaving your property. So always on a leash, um, using a short leash as opposed to the longer retractable leashes um, just allows you to have more control over your dog. And so it's not getting out ahead of you and, and maybe getting um, into some shrubs where there may be javelina. Um, you know, really the best thing you can do when walking um, is using your own senses and your own awareness um, to detect what's going on around you. Um, so in this day and age, a lot of people sort of tune out. Um, they may be using their walk time um, as a time to catch up with, with friends on the phone, or maybe they're plugged into music, um, you know, just, just being distracted in general. So you want to be, be able to, you know, use all of your own senses to um, to know what's going on around you so that you can detect as early as possible if there is um, wildlife in the area. Now some wildlife like we talked about are predatory. Um, some like the javelina are not predatory but that we know how they react when there's a predator um, nearby. Um, and so we, we wanna make sure that we detect it um, as soon as possible so that we can avoid any kind of um, you know close proximity. And so when you see that there's javelina out ahead of you um, and you're walking your dog, you can be, you know, say, okay, let's turn around and go in the other direction. And, and you know, in most cases, um, if, you, if you do that, you know, with enough uh, a distance between you, there's, there's really no conflict. And obviously if there's a certain place where the javelina are bedding down, like in a wash, um, there's a, pro you know, a, a property that has a lot of vegetation or something like that, that, that they like to, uh, you know, they like to bed down in, then I would avoid, I would avoid taking that route, or maybe you, you know, cross the streets, make sure that you give some more distance that way. Um, if, if it comes to uh, where you have the javelin actually approach you and they're, you know, fairly close, um, you know, maintaining your cool, not panicking. Um, you don't want to, you know, turn tail and run because what's likely to happen is, you know, you slip on gravel or something like that. And then, you know, you've, you've injured yourself. Um, so making loud noises, um, you don't necessarily have to carry anything 
um, special with you, you know, your own voice, clapping your hands, stomping your feet um, can be enough of a deterrent. It may not mean that the javelina are going to run away from you, but really all you want is to make sure they don't continue to approach so that you can turn around and safely leave the area with your dog. And so making a bunch of noise, um, if, if they're close and they are not, you know, they're continuing to approach, grabbing whatever's handy, you know, a stick, um, gravel, throw it at them, make contact with them. Um, you're trying to let them know, hey, you know, you need to, you need to back off and, uh, and, and then you can safely leave the area. Some, some people our, do. Some of our residents uh, have taken to carrying walking sticks and also pepper spray. Are either of those useful or effective or not? Um, so a walking stick, I think is great. Um, I think it, <laughs> I think it can, you know, if nothing else, um, help you feel a little bit more, um, a more, more safe. It gives you a little bit of courage because you've got that stick in hand. You can use it. If the javelina were to approach close enough, you can actually, you know, put your walking stick between the javelina and the dog. Um, if you, if they're close enough and, and, and it looks like they're not stopping, you can use it to actually whack them. Um, so give them a good whack. And uh, again, so that you can leave the area safely. So that um, definitely is a, is, a good, um, is a good tool to use. Um, the pepper spray, you know, that's kind of up to the individual. Um, but if, you know, if you're that concerned about javelina and it's, you know, it's a pretty alarming experience, you want to make sure that you don't, that, that I guess you're really thinking about um, the conditions in which you use that. And so you don't want to quickly just grab it and start spraying around. First of all, you don't want the air to be moving in such a way that you breathe it in or your dog breathes it in um, or you get it in your eyes. Um, you, you know, so you also probably wouldn't want to, um, what, ha what happens when Havelina get alarmed, um, one of their defense mechanisms is to scatter. And so if they were to, you know, predator were to come up, um, in their midst, if they scatter, then, you know, everybody's going, you know, every which way and not, you know, not, maybe somebody gets eaten, but, but, you know, everybody's gone in a different direction and it's not like, you know, every harm is going to come to everybody. So if you, um, you know, if you think about, you know, being right in the midst of a herd and spraying pepper spray. So now all of a sudden you have, um, <laughs> you know, you, you have a bunch of animals that are in pain and they're panicked and they may just run into you. Um, just because that, you know, you happen to be in the path that one panicked animal is, is running into. Um, so just, thinking about those kinds of things as like proximity and, you know, really understanding how, um, how the air is, is moving around you so that you don't end up, you know, harming yourself. So it is, um, it's a, an okay method, but, you know, just use that method with caution. Um, sometimes just a, uh, a children's toy squirt gun can work and you can put something in there like, um, white vinegar, you can buy that by the gallon at Costco. Um, you could use lemon juice, um, but basically you're, you're spraying something with an acrid taste and smell in the air. And so that can be another deterrent. Um, and it's small enough that, um, you know, you can easily carry that with you in a pocket or a fanny pack or something like that. Um, one thing to think about whether it's predatory wildlife or whether it's javelina when you're walking your dog, if you have a small dog and you can pick the dog up, that would be the thing to do. And that way it just, it, it takes your dog up out of reach. Um, you can obviously have more control over your dog and hopefully um, just leave the area safely with your dog. So uh, all of those are good strategies, but really, you know, like I said, being aware of everything that's going on around you can can give you a heads up, can give you more time to react and figure out what to do just to avoid. Um, but I will say that, you know, we've got many, 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 um, you know, hundreds of thousands of dogs, uh, you know, in, in Tucson. And uh, we also have Havelina that live throughout our communities. Um, and it's not just you guys are surrounded by 
some natural areas. You have you have a natural landscape around as well. Um, but but you know some of these wildlife, javelina live in in you know the heart of town. So um, you think of you know downtown Tucson or you know Speedway and Campbell or Grant and Swan, um, these very um, extremely developed, um, high density residential um, areas, and you have javelina that, that live here. They complete their life cycles here. These are urban animals. They're not coming in to visit, to get a meal. Um, they are, they're living out their, their life cycles um, in an urban area. And so, um, you know, we, for the most part, can get by just fine. Um, you know, walking our dogs and doing our, you know, the things that we want to do um, while living with wildlife. Uh, but there are ways that, you know, that we can, that steps that we can take to, um, to avoid conflict and to, you know, just err on the side of caution. So that was a good topic. Another Any question that's come in uh, was uh, several times last year, this attendee saw bobcats or coyotes out during the day and not just at dawn or dusk. Why would that be? So um, I think humans, oftentimes we like order. We like to understand how things work and we attribute certain um, parameters or qualities um, to wildlife, like that animal's nocturnal or that animal's diurnal. Um, but the truth is that wildlife can be active at any time of day. So there is no rule book for wildlife that they consult up. Whoops, I can't come out until 6 p.m. Or I can't come out until the temperature, you know, goes down to 75. Um, they're, they're going to be active um, whenever it's comfortable for them to do so. Um, sometimes you have a situation where something might get disturbed and so it's more active. Um, you know, you, you can see skunks um, active during the day. Sometimes you find bats that are fluttering around during the day. It's not the typical thing. Um, you know, bobcats are active quite a bit during the day. So um, uh, no hard and fast rules for, for any of that. One of the questions that's come up uh, many times through the years that I've been here in uh, San Cedillo Valley was what are the uh, uh, the rules uh, from the state level uh, or are there rules that uh, allow or prohibit uh, the HOA or residents of our HOA from uh, having animals removed or relocated? So our department licenses people um, they're called wildlife control businesses to do things like relocations. And so that is an option for most species. Um, the things that you're going to see excluded for that are going to be things like our game animals. So um, when it comes to javelina or mountain lions or bears or, you know, those types of things, um, you know, a private community or resident um, isn't going to, isn't going to be able to do that in most cases to, to hire a company to, um, to really relocate wildlife. Um, when I... When you say isn't going to be able to, I mean is not permitted to? Correct. Um, so Havelina, that there are some exceptions sometimes. Um, but generally, if we go back to what I spoke about at the beginning, is if you have in your mind that, you know, this species is problematic and therefore I want it gone, um, you're probably not ever going to find much resolution because you're focusing on the animal or animals that are right in front of you in the moment. And if everything else remains constant, um, no changes are made, well, the reasons that animal persists in the community are still going to be there, whether that animal or group of animals um, is there or not. And so what you're gonna have is now a vacant territory or, um, or home range that is gonna be available to the next animals that come along. And so really, um, I limit, my referrals um, 
to wildlife control businesses, to those situations where you have wildlife that are actually taking up residence in your home. Um, so for example, you have uh, raccoons that are in your attic. Um, that's a situation where you need to have the wildlife removed from your space. And then after that, um, there needs to be some kind of physical exclusion. And so however that animal or group of animals was able to access that attic space, you want to make sure that it is um, that it's buttoned up and, and secured. Um, so that's kind of an example of when it would be um, helpful to use a wildlife control business to relocate that animal. Um, so coming back to, to the thank you, that's, that, that helps a lot. Uh, but coming back to the specific situations where we have animals or groups of animals, uh, either in people's yards, not in their houses, but in their yards, uh, or on the sidewalks or streets or on our golf course, uh, uh, or other common areas uh, for javelinas, bobcats, mountain lions. Uh, are there any situations uh, where those are be permitted to be re uh, relocated or are there no situations? Um, so it depends on the species. So for, I think you mentioned coyotes. And I think, you know, for all of this, we want to frame everything in um, having reasonable expectations. And so we know we live in this part of Arizona and in Southern Arizona, you know, we have this wealth of wildlife. Uh, we, you know, your community has got proximity to the tortillitas, it's got proximity to the Catalinas. And so, you know, understanding what species live in this area, what species are likely to be found here um, all the time, what species um, sometimes wander into areas, um, if you have the if you have the expectation um, that you may encounter these species or you're going to encounter this you know this species often and, and this one every once in a while and you know maybe what to do if you sh if you do encounter if there's if there's any reason to concern or for concern or you need to report that kind of thing that's that's important is understanding those expectations also you mentioned a golf course golf courses are huge attractants for wildlife. So you have, you know, a very arid climate here. And then all of a sudden, you know, you, you uh, plant um, a bunch of turf and it's nice and moist and it has grubs and it has green grass. And so you have javelina and you have rabbits and that attracts bobcats and coyotes and, you know, on and on. So really, uh, you know, understanding that there are resources that um, there's ways that humans have modified the landscape that um, that may originally have been negative because they removed natural habitat, but ultimately kind of provide resources again in a different way. And so you're going to always expect um, if you have really lush plantings or you have something like a golf course in your community, you're probably gonna see um, wildlife uh, maybe a, a higher diversity of wildlife, um, or you're just going to have wildlife that are that are present because they're going to utilize those resources. So, so putting everything into context and, and understanding what is um, what's likely to be there, and that these things are part of the landscape is really going to go a long ways towards um, decreasing frustration, I think. And so, um, you know, for coyotes. Uh, those are animals that are ubiquitous. Um, they are across the United States and, and North America, and they do really well because they, you know, can occupy just about every niche. Um, they eat lots of vegetable matter. Um, they can be scavengers. They can be predators. Uh, they are, they're going to be around to some extent. So there's no way you're going to say, eh, I don't want coyotes on the landscape because whatever, I want to leave my little dogs out in the backyard or something like that. It's, that's not a reasonable expectation. Um, can you hire a company to um, remove an animal or animals? Yes, you can. Um, for animals like javelina, um, that's, it's not usually our go-to. Uh, really what's going to resolve conflict is gonna be addressing the attractants or why those animals are remaining in the area. Um, and so, you really want to look at, okay, if they're spending lots of time on my property, what do I have? Um, what do I need to make uh, unavailable to them? Are they getting into 
garbage each week. So is there, you know, a need to secure my garbage can um, throughout the week? Or maybe it's they, they get it when I put it out at the curb the night before collection. Um, and so you, you know, you understand that really if you put it out the morning of or as close to collection time as possible, um, you're just decreasing that window where it's available. But anyway, the, the, the bottom line is you're looking at ways to remove some of those attractants or the, the reasons why the wildlife are um, really remaining in the area. So they have to find food. Um, if they're not able to find it in the community, they will have a larger area that they use. And it, it doesn't mean that you won't ever see javelina if, you know, everybody only has native plants in their yard. No, they're still gonna, they live in the area, they're still gonna come through from time to time. They may munch on your prickly pear um, or eat your mesquite pods, um, but it isn't, it isn't like, you know, something extra special that they're coming in for. So you really wanna key in on, on those attractants um, versus I think that this animal is a problem, um, you know, or I'm tired of, you know, these animals coming around because you know, I, you know, whatever, I think it poses a risk to my pets or, so or that the, kind of thing. So one of, one of the questions that's come in uh, is uh, the, uh, uh, the attendee says earlier this year, we had two coyotes that frequented uh, behind our home on the golf course. They were very mangy and sickly looking. One of the coyotes uh, came into our garage unprovoked and bit my husband. I, uh, uh, if you see mangy coyotes that are not acting normally, why can't you get them relocated before they attack people? That's the question. So you're talking about a couple of different things there um, in terms of disease and, and coyotes, again, are one of those things that, yes, absolutely, um, you can hire a wildlife control business to have them, um, to have them relocated. Um, mange is a common condition in coyotes. Unfortunately, it seems to be more common in, uh, you know, in urban coyotes, probably because they don't have quite the natural diet um, that they do elsewhere. Um, it's just, it's one of those things that, um, that can be problematic. They can recover from it. Sometimes they eventually succumb. They can survive for years with it. It doesn't, um, it doesn't make, it, you know, behavior wise, it doesn't make them aggressive or anything like that. So what you want to do, um, and we've talked mostly about attractants, which is really, um, how we, how we go about resolving conflict. Um, the other piece of that is using strategies to haze or discourage the presence of wildlife. Um, I don't, I don't focus on that as much because you can haze an animal all you want and you can get it to leave in the immediate term. Um, but you go back inside and, you know, whatever it is, is going to come back and, and continue to, to utilize whatever resources is there. Um, so you want to you want to use a combination of these strategies. Um, but the biggest thing is the attractants. But um, but using the hazing is also important um, and can also be very effective. Coyotes are intelligent animals. They can learn to avoid certain people, certain places. Um, in, in most cases, these animals are living among people. They don't have great fear of us because they see us each and every day. And in most cases, there are not negative consequences for them being close to people. And so they are not gonna run away at the sight of a human. Um, so kind of reinstilling sort of a natural fear and avoidance of people is great. It's a good idea, good steps to take. Um, Coyote bites, wildlife bites to humans in general are extremely rare. Um, and so uh, I, I, say, I would say that, you know, a bite, like in the situation you described, is probably nothing to do with mange, um, but more likely a factor of an animal getting fed. Um, for coyotes, again, on the rare occasion where we're getting where they fed, have, you mean being hand fed by, by people. people, and it's not always um, hand fed. Like here's the, um, you know, let me put it in your mouth. Although people do that with javelina, and they do get bitten um, that way. But, but yeah, you know, leaving uh, pet food out or food scraps, um, throw throw your leftovers behind the wall, kind of a thing. Um, and so coyotes are smart, they understand, they know where that food came from. They know that, you know, people, whatever, they throw their sandwich at them, they think it's cute, they get a picture, whatever. Um, 
you know, those, those situations basically um, cause uh, animals and, you know, we're talking about coyotes to, to become habituated to, to getting food from people. And so um, there have been cases where they will actually nip somebody because they're like, Hey, where's my granola bar? Or, you know, where's my sandwich? Um, you know, so another, I'm, I'm another, waiting. Another attendee has asked uh, about uh, being uh, about potentially odd behavior because animals are rabid. And so if, if one is bitten or approached by an animal, uh, is there somebody this should be reported to? How would they report it? Uh, so if something? somebody gets bitten, then really they should always seek medical attention. If you're, if you're, if you've gotten bitten by, um, by wildlife, you want to seek medical attention, um, for, you know, mammal bites, um, rabies is always a concern and it's not that, oh my gosh, rabies is rampant and anytime, you know, you get bitten, um, by wildlife, it must be rabid. Um, you know, as I said, there's, there are circumstances, you know, rare circumstances where people get bitten by wildlife and, and in, in most cases, it's, it's what we, we would call provoked. Um, so it's not, uh, it's not a situation where, you know, just randomly, but regardless, if you get bitten by wildlife, you want to seek medical attention. And usually the medical provider is going to notify um, the county. Um, and so, uh, you know, if it's a, if it's a situation where, um, you know, uh, a lot of a lot of a lot of the testing that goes on for rabies is is due to domestic animals pet exposures um like your dogs kill a skunk that entered the backyard and so um the authorities are going to want to verify that your animal maybe your cat you let your cat roam free and it brought in a, a bat um they're going to want to verify that your animal is current on its rabies vaccine so that's really important to always, uh, always have your animals, your pets current on their rabies vaccines. Um, and then obviously if the animal is in hand, like, you know, the cat brought in the bat or the skunk is dead in the yard, then they can go ahead and test that animal. Um, if it's a situation where it's a coyote and it's, you know, long gone, you don't know which coyote it was, um, you know, in terms of rabies that the, the, the person who, the, who was bitten is going to have to, uh, you know, get, um, as a precaution, undergo um, some post-exposure rabies vaccines. And so, um, yes, they can, they can call um, our department, Game and Fish Department, um, but yes, in theory, um, we would be notified about these kinds of things. Um, any bites to humans from wildlife should be reported directly to us. And um, you can call our dispatch. They are, uh, they're available 24 seven. So every day of the year. Um, and that number is 623-236-7201. So any time of the day or night, um, something that, that happens, you can absolutely uh, report that to us. What about um, uh, another question that's come in is, uh... Who, uh, who or what uh, sh should one contact uh, if you see an animal, uh, presumably in this case, they're talking about uh, 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 non-domestic animals who might be hurt? Or you have injured wildlife? Yes. Um, so from our department perspective, um, uh, going back to what I talked to at the beginning, we manage wildlife on a population level. So we are not looking to intervene when you know, you find that uh, you see a coyote that has mange or you see, you know, a bobcat that's limping or, you know, you see a deer with choy on its nose. Um, in most cases, we're not, we're not going to respond to those things. That's part of being a wild animal um, is that, you know, you succumb to disease just like people do, except, you know, most of us have, have the ability um, to, you know, to seek medical help. Um, so that's different from wildlife, but, you know, they, they succumb to diseases, they, you know, incur injuries and things like that. Um, so that's not something that, um, that, that we're going to respond to in most cases. So your if department a, wouldn't respond. Are there other organizations that they should report these or um, might so report it, these to? 
I will say that if there's a situation where an animal is not mobile anymore, it, I mean, it really isn't able to move. And so it's down and out, it's in your yard, um, it's not going anywhere. In those cases, we try to respond and be able to euthanize that animal. Um, in some cases, injured animals can go to uh, what we call wildlife rehabilitators. And these folks, that is kind of what they're looking at is individual animals. It's, you know, this, this bird broke its wing, you know, it flew into my window. That, that would be a call for a wildlife rehabilitator. Um, those types of things. So how would they find those folks? Contact your, uh, your, your helpline? Um, actually, that's all online. And so um, I will give you the URL for our Living with Wildlife webpage. Um, it's a great resource for um, people who want to learn more about our, our common wildlife and ways to, to uh, you know, to live alongside them to coexist safely. And so kind of everything that we've been talking about, you can kind of go and read up more about living with bobcats or coyotes and so on. And there are also links there. Um, there's going to be a link on that page. This is contact a wildlife rehabilitator. It'll pull up a, a map of Arizona and then you can see where there are um, licensed facilities. And so that would be the best way to, um, to do that. And also on that page, um, there's a link to contact a wildlife control business, which we talked about before. Those are the folks that our department licenses to um, to do relocations. And so, uh, so I, that's I think I'm presenting the uh, that page on the, on the screen of this. Yep, exactly. Uh, so if you scroll one? down, uh -huh. yep. If you scroll down a little bit, you can you'll see those links that I'm talking about. So in that first um, bullet point there, right you'll here. see, you know, yep, yep. And up at top, you'll see those are the different species that, you know, you can kind of learn more about um, and click on any one of those. But yes, the wild, the rehabilitators and the wildlife control businesses are listed there. Um, and real important, we kind of touched on it a little bit because we talked about the coyote bite. Um, but if you scroll down just a tiny bit more, you'll see this brochure called um, keep wildlife wild. Um, and you should be able to click on that and get that uh, PDF of that brochure. Um, but feeding wildlife is unlawful. And so as you can imagine, it does tend to create conflict with people and pets. And, um, and therefore it is, it is prohibited. And so, um, you know, if you come to find out that you have a neighbor or somebody in your community that is doing that kind of thing, um, you want to make sure that you do report that to us, to the Arizona Game and Fish Department, um, so that we can, we can approach that, um, you know, from a law enforcement perspective and, and, and put an end to that. So it can certainly cause problems and conflicts, but yep, that's the, that's the site. Lots of good stuff there. So another question that came in is, uh, how can you find out about volunteer opportunities with the Arizona Game and Fish Department? So that is done, you know, on a region by region level. And so um, you would contact our Tucson office. So our Tucson region kind of covers the whole Southeast portion of the state um, and but the volunteer opportunities would be coordinated out of out of our regional office in Tucson um, and and there's you know we have opportunities from anything from helping with paperwork to being out there and you know uh, helping make wildlife friend, install wildlife friendly fencing or doing habitat projects or helping with you know um, you know, monitoring of, of species and, you know, there's very, you know, complete variety of different types of projects, building um, or um, sort of restoring waters for wildlife. So, you know, really anything that kind of that you can think of to fit people's, um, you know, interest and, and, and uh, skill set. Uh, so you can contact our, our Tucson office. Now, 
you know, things are a little bit different. Um, so is, with yeah, again, the, I, I, I think I'm showing it on the screen. Is this the correct uh, region? You sure are. Yep. Yeah. That's our, that's our address. That's our phone number. Um, things are a little bit different um, with the pandemic. And so, you know, obviously we don't have um, as much presence of volunteers in our office now. Um, but, you know, things, things will eventually, um, you know, push back towards, towards normal, <laughs> uh, <clears throat> hopefully once we, once we address this virus, but, you know, that it would, you can contact our, our Tucson office for, um, you know, for volunteer opportunities and thank you for your interest. Well, I think that's all the questions we had coming in. We still have about 30 people in attendance. Are there other topics that, I'm sorry if I interrupted you and, and got you uh, off of your uh, list of topics you wanted to cover. You, you did um, mention garbage at one point and things we might do. Garbage is a big attractant for um, for javelina in particular, but it can be for raccoons, it can be for coyotes. And so looking at ways to, you know, you wanna make sure that, that during the week your can is um, inside a garage, preferably. Um, if it's not inside a garage, maybe it's in a walled backyard. Um, if, if it, you know, depending on what's getting into it, if raccoons are getting into it, well, you know, obviously they can climb into a yard. You might have to look at, um, you know, putting some kind of latch or lock on the lid um, if, you, if you don't have a garage to put it in. But, you know, just securing it to, um, to a carport post or to a tree or to a fence or something like that, just so it can't be knocked over. Um, and then, you know, the wildlife make use of, of that um of that resource so yeah garbage is a, is a big one and like i said before um you know putting the bins out the day before you may think it's convenient but it's not convenient if you have to pick up all your garbage and put it in the in the back in the bin um a second time it's it's not fun um i i've had to do it myself and uh you know learn the hard way um, once, once Havelina kind of figure out what day of the week is trash day in your community, um, they're sure to come through and, and just knock those cans over one by one and, and uh, you know, have at it. So um, putting that bin out um, the day of collection and, and again, as close to collection time as possible is going to save you a lot of, a lot of heartache. Um, and having to pick that stuff up again. But yeah, we kind of bounced around from topic to topic. Hopefully I fully addressed each of those questions um, that people were asking, I think in terms of relocation, there were other species people were asking about um, like mountain lions. Um, so mountain lions are one of those critters like the bears that typically they're living up in the higher elevations, um, but they do come down um, from time to time into our you know, into our urban fringes, and they are often looking for resources, right? They're, they're looking for food, or they're looking for water. Um, those types of sightings, mountain lions and bears, um, we do ask that you report those to us. It doesn't mean that we're going to run out there and do something like try to, you know, tranquilize the animal and, you know, drag it back up the mountain. These animals will move back up in most cases. Um, so if it's even if it's just a sighting, we we like to be aware of what's going on. Um, it helps us know, um, you know, what uh, the status is, what patterns are. If behavior becomes um, concerning to us, uh, so we won't know that unless people unless people tell us. But you know, you those are those are a couple critters that you're not going to see them every day like you might see um, the javelina and the coyotes. But you know, from time to time. Uh, you know, have them on your radar and understand that, you know, it is possible for them to, to come down and, and be in the community for a short while. So if there are other questions that uh, the your attendees would like to ask, please type them in while we've got uh, Lakana here. Uh, it, it, it's uh, no extra charge to ask a couple extra questions right now. That's right. And, and if there's something you think of later, you can always call me. Uh, my phone number is 520-388-4446. And so, uh, you know, be happy to chat with you more about what might be going on um, for you or on your property. I know that um, 
Julian mentioned some some animals. She mentioned badger, I guess. So it sounds like maybe people have been, or at least some people have seen badgers, um, which is I think pretty cool. Uh, it's not a super common critter um, down here, but certainly yeah, one that uh, that is native to the area. Um, so I didn't, I don't know um, anything else that people want to talk well, about another, unusual another question sighting that's, another question that's come in is about uh snakes uh, so the question was uh if, if someone has a, a rattlesnake in the yard uh or a snake in general that they are uh, concerned about uh who can they call to remove it i, I think we know the answer here it's going to be a uh, golder ranch uh, fire department you could uh, just call 911 and uh, let them know it's not an emergency but it's a yeah uh, they a probably have a, a non-emergency line but yeah so some some fire departments will do that they're not going to remove um, non-venomous animals and they're probably not going to um, move rattlesnakes unless they're actually you know in your yard and so if you you know i think it's it's reasonable for us to to want to have a certain safe space for our kids to play in a yard or our pets to be um in our yard um and not be uh you know not encounter um some of these critters that that could cause harm um but you know out and about you know it's it's out in a in a you know an area maybe there's a trail through open space or something like that you know that's that's native wildlife you can expect to find that um snakes play a very important role both venomous and non-venomous in in um you know population control of of those lovely rodents and things that uh, that people often take exception to so um it, it is they 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 are important parts of our ecosystem um and i think it's it's good to understand that and um and to you know to be aware to be cautious you know we live in the desert and and really we have lots of pokey things and spines and thorns and things that um that bite and you know can be venomous and so you know watching where we step and and where we put our hands and that kind of thing is always a good idea um but you know again go back to having reasonable expectations um the fire department isn't going to come out and remove something from open space um however if it's in your if it's in your backyard or you know it's on your front porch um that's something that they may uh that they may help you out with those wildlife control businesses that we looked at that link on our living with wildlife web page um those folks are also licensed to do that kind of work Another question has come in is, uh, uh, how have the uh, high, highway uh, wildlife overpasses and underpasses been working like the one that uh, recently installed uh, in the uh, Catalina area in on North Oracle Road? Have they um, uh, been effective? Uh, have they changed anything about uh, patterns of movement? Um, so there's lots of, uh, lots of camera monitoring, um, from different organizations. So our department has cameras, um, you have some nonprofits, you have school groups that monitor cameras. Um, so it's kind of become a big part of, um, kind of community engagement as well as scientific research. Um, but yes, there has been, um, you know, those, those, uh, those cameras have documented lots of use. Um, of those culverts and bridges. Um, and so, you know, yes, that's, it, it is effective. Um, I'm trying to think, um, I'm not sure where, where somebody could find the data. We probably do have it somewhere um, that would be accessible or, you know. Uh, if, if you pass it to me later in an email, I'll pass it along to the community. Yeah, if I, if I can find out, you know, if we've, got, if we've got that somewhere that people can go and take a look. Um, but yeah, those, you know, in general, um, these, these various types of crossings are, are really effective um, in, uh, in helping our wildlife, um, you know, you know, counteracting essentially habitat fragmentation and they kind of provide corridors and also make it safer um, for vehicles. Um, you know, you want to have fewer collisions, obviously, um, especially with with larger wildlife that that could cause great harm. Another question that's come in is can snakes actually climb over a solid wall such as concrete block or brick wall? Yes, um, you know, in general, um, they go around 
obviously at ground level. And if they come across an opening, they would come in that way. So if there were a gap around a gate or maybe a gap under a gate, or maybe um, you have drainage holes um, for, in your wall that allow the water to, um, to escape, those are places where snakes might get in. That would be the most common thing. Well, we also have rodents. But, we also have rodents burrowing underneath the walls, and we've right. had uh, snakes coming in through uh, through those rodent holes as well. Yep. So, and, and yes, in some cases, you will find that um, that snakes can kind of you know brace themselves and shimmy. And particularly if two walls come together and they're like in that corner, they can you know basically use both. Uh, both walls um, to to get up, so yeah, they they can absolutely climb. Or there's a tree, um, a branch overhanging, or something like that. So yes, that that can happen. But like I said, in most cases, it's going to be something that they come across at ground level that's going to provide them entry. And you know, those those things can easily be addressed um, using hardware cloth. I would use a quarter inch hardware cloth to cover those. Um, the drainage holes in walls, um, it will still allow the water to go through, but it keeps out, you know, some of the things that, that you might be concerned about, like toads or snakes or, um, you know, depending Another on question how that's come are. in is, uh, have the summer fires in the Catalinas and Tortolitas affected the animal behavior in terms of becoming more urban at all? Um, you know, I would say largely not, um, you know, things kind of, things are continually changing on the landscape. And so while a fire um, is gonna, is gonna cause animal movements in the immediate term and that fire is going, and then, um, you know, perhaps after that things are kind of, um, you know, maybe there aren't as many resources because things have been burned significantly, but, you know, usually fairly quickly you'll see that you're going to have your some of your plants the small herbaceous stuff and things like that are going to start regenerating and you're going to have um, animals moving back into those areas so no um there's not there was never any like mass exodus you know from the mountains into the urban areas um you know due to the fires can it happen incidentally here and there yeah of course um but you know in general we just have a lot of wildlife um, a lot of different types of wildlife that that live among us and are attracted to things that we provide. Um, so, you know, we, we can just expect that we're going to see um, certain critters more often than others, um, just as as part of where we live. Yeah, we just had a stag uh, with a full rack uh, in our backyard a few nights ago. And uh, by one, one of the other uh, people uh, who are attendees said, uh, just an observation they had a gold's turkey in their yard last year yeah yeah and sometimes those guys are moving around and come down and we find them in the strangest places i think we found them on davis month and one time um <laughs> so uh they absolutely will will move around uh, you know some as well well i think that's all the questions let me just check uh oh here we go uh, our garage door is hard to seal at the bottom due to uneven concrete. What is the best way to keep animals out? Poison, a spray, a physical barrier. We are stumped. So I would say I've seen things I, that are um, that people can put um, that basically they you lay across the um, where the garage door comes out. So it kind of comes up. It makes sort of a lip. That that you know raises rises up to to meet your garage door um, at you know just above ground level. So look into something like that. Poisons um, are never recommended for um, for wildlife. They have really far-reaching unintended um, consequences. Um, pretty much, uh, you know what happens is it uh, it it kills uh, it kills the the target animals, the rodents, um, but in the time that it's kind of working on those animals, um, you know, these anticoagulant rodenticides really take several days um, or a week to uh, to cause that animal to die. It's, they're slowly bleeding out internally. And in that time, of course, they're gonna be sluggish um, and moving more slowly and more susceptible to predation. 
Um, and so really we, you know, they found everything from mountain lions, you know, on up to mountain lions that, that uh, die, their cause of death is rodenticide. Um, and so your scavengers, um, you know, you'll get vultures and, and raptors and, um, per, you know, just throughout the food web, uh, you're going to, you're going to pass that poison on. So we don't want to, we don't want to use those methods. We want to really rely on things that, um, that make sense from a practical perspective. Um, I think a lot of people oftentimes want to resolve, um, you know, a conflict with a spray, like, okay, well, uh, you know, I don't like the, the coyotes around, or I don't like the javelina around. And like, so what can I spray? Can I spray... Um, you know, mountain lion urine or something like, you know, pepper spray or something like that to, you know, they'll, they'll smell that and they won't come around anymore. Probably not. Um, I don't think, you know, that kind of approach is really effective. Uh, you know, Havelina have no problem living in communities where there's tons of predators, right? There are dogs everywhere, dogs in, in many, many yards and, you know, it smells like dogs everywhere and there are coyotes and everything like that. So um, predator urine is probably not going to dissuade them from coming into your yard. So I would not think so much about things to spray as a deterrent as you know, creating like just a physical barrier. So they, I, you know, I know they make, um, they make strips um, that, that you can lay down on uh, just below where your garage door comes down to keep, um, keep water out or keep, you know, rodents out or that kind of thing. By the way, uh, Pam Sopralius, who's uh, one of our, uh, our, uh, our managers here at the HOA said she wanted to thank you, Makana, uh, for a great presentation to our community. Uh, so thank you very much. And oh, you're very welcome. One of the other uh, uh, attendees said uh, that they are they they are new to the community and to the desert. So she uh, she and her husband really appreciate this offering and uh, your time and perspective and expertise. So thank you. Excellent. Good. And like I said, um, that that website is a great place. Um, if you don't find the, you know, answers that you're looking for, or you have more questions, feel free to call me and uh, we can talk further about uh, what's going on for you. Well, uh, given the fact that we don't have any other questions coming in, have if, if you covered all the topics you wanted to cover today? I believe so. Well, thank you so much. I'll go ahead and close it. And uh, uh, and uh, speak with Pam as to whether she wants to make this uh, recording available later for the community. Uh, All thank right. Thank you so much. Sounds good. Have a good day.